Thank you for joining us at the NTU STEM graduation colloquium. This event is a joint effort from the Institute of Advanced Study, together with Graduate Research Club from SPMS and EEE, as well as Bio Graduation Student Club. It's our honor today to host Professor Ulimio Lazani, who is the Director of Center for Nanoscience and Technology from the Italian Institute of Technology. His topic for today will be on organic semiconductor nanoparticles and how to use it for the vision restoration in the blind retinas. Before we formally begin, I would like to remind all participants to ask your questions during your Q&A sessions, and please use the recent features at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And during the Q&A sessions, when your name is called, you can actually admit yourself and ask your questions. Alternatively, you can also post your question in the Q&A box. Please refrain from posting your question in the chat box. Now, without further ado, I'll hand over the time to Prof. Lazani. Prof, please. Thank you very much uh, for this introduction. Thank you very much to Professor Sam and uh, to the, the board organizing this event for, for the invitation. I'm really happy. The only thing I'm, I'm not, I mean, I'm not so happy that I'm here and not in Singapore, but this is how things went uh, this time. Um, still, it's a great opportunity for me to talk about my research. You, you heard the title. Uh, the first thing I want to do is more on, um, say, talking on how is the research. Uh, when you do things like uh, this bio application that goes towards the clinical application, uh, it, it's, it's something, of course, that is extremely interdisciplinary. You see here there is a huge uh, group working on it. So it's, it's really a, a big uh, um, multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary uh, initiative and dealer, and uh, there are uh, biologists, uh, uh, besides physicists, chemists, engineers, then there are biologists, there are medical doctors, neuroscientists, all involved and, uh, in, in, in the research. And for sure, this is a challenge in, in, for us. I'm a physicist, so I'm talking to people in, in semiconductor physics, probably they understand that there is a barrier to get into this kind of research, but there is also a reward. Now, what I'm going to show you today uh, is that we are able to rescue vision. You see the red spot point here is to rescue vision in blind. Uh, I say retina, that means in, in animal model, because so far that's what we can do. Where, where we are uh, right now is at this level. Um, so so that, that's the main, the main result we are talking about. Uh, now, let me start with some uh, simple introduction on the retina. You know, the retina at the bottom of the eye transduces light into an electrical signal that eventually go to the, uh, to the brain through the optic nerve. It's, uh, it's a complex system made by a, a series of neuronal levels, levels, layers, say. And in particular, at the bottom, uh, there are the photoreceptors. These are uh, about, we have about 120 million rods and about a uh, few millions, five, five six million uh, cones. Uh, it's, it's curious that the photoreceptor are at the bottom and the light should go through all the uh, neural layer, which means all the circuit that uh, uh, process the signal before being detected. So that, that's a, a curiosity of, of nature. Um, the photoreceptor have two uh, different uh, roles. So the, the roles are, uh, uh, as you say, as I told you, they are much more dispersed. And you see in this picture, the roles are everywhere. In the, in the retina, and but there is a point, a small point called fovea, fovea or macula. In spite of being 4% of the total area, it's responsible for the high resolution vision and the high contrast vision, the conscious vision. It takes about 50% of the activity of the visual cortex. And in the fovea, there are uh, main, only cones, and those are of three types red, green, and blue, and they give us the High resolution because they are small, few couple of microns, and uh, the color vision. While roads uh, are larger, especially going towards the periphery, become larger in the periphery of the retina, and, uh, and they only see in black and white, so they see only one color. Now, degradation of the photoreceptors can lead to um, impairment, visual impairment, and eventually blindness. Uh, this can proceed from uh, uh, the periphery, because the, if uh, the degradation starts to attack first the roads, and this is the situation of retina pigmentosa, or they can start from the cones, and then uh, um, the patient lose first the central vision, and this is macular degeneration. So both these diseases are associated to degradation, degeneration of the photoreceptors. 
And um, retinitis pigmentosa is considered a rare disease, it, it, and it, it has a genetic origin, even though there are hundreds of genes involved, so it's difficult to make a specific uh, gene therapy. While uh, macular degeneration is uh, much more prevalent, especially in an aging population, you see here that uh, over 65, years old, uh, um, about one out of four start to have some sign of macular degeneration. So it's becoming really endemic. Now, the, now so this is the problem, no? this is the, the situation and the challenge that we have. This kind of disease uh, disorder cannot be um, at, this, at the end stage, there are no solutions. So what we can do is just, uh, is only to uh, think to replace that photoreceptor with prosthesis. Uh, our work start, um, sorry, with something side of, of the main topic that I told you, because what we did at the beginning was uh, noticing that there are this specific spectral feature was to develop photodiodes, organic photodiodes that could detect light with the same spectral response of, of natural photoreceptors. Now we did a patent for this and uh, we were aiming to build a colorimeter. But now I, I can talk, say if you want, I can give you some more detail about this. But so the point here is the following that we, so we learn uh, that organic semiconductor can have a very similar spectral response than the photoreceptor in the retina. You see here that the match between our device and uh, the natural uh, spectral response of the photo of the um, yeah, let's say of the photoreceptor is very is very good. Um, but then uh, more than uh, developing the colorimetry that is is an industrial application, it's interesting, but. Uh, I, I start to think that I could use this material to replace photoreceptor. So if I do something that behaves like a photoreceptor, why not thinking to, to replace the photoreceptor in the retina? And then there was a second leg of the story is that uh, at the same time, we were uh, launching this startup, it's called Ribestech. Uh, Ribestech does uh, printed photovoltaics, uh, and those are uh, fully flexible uh, plastic photovoltaics. So using this polymer, polyfill zip thiophene, that you see here, which is a prototype for, um, for photovoltaics, we developed the first uh, uh, example, the first prototypes. Now they do not use this polymer anymore, but this polymer remain as uh, one of the workhorse in, in the field. Now, um, <clears throat> this, this cell is, is flexible. And so uh, the first thing I was thinking was to, to use this and, and to put it in the retina. And uh, this was, uh, I should admit, uh, totally wrong for two reasons. Number one, there is a metal electrode and you should get rid of it if you want to go in a liquid environment as it is the biological environment. So what we did first was to study if you can make a device in which there is no metal cathode on top. And indeed we, we succeed because you see here in this electrochemical cell, for instance, that there is just a polymer and the ITO as a counter electrode and uh, as is well known, I mean, the, the current and the open circuit uh, for the voltage can be generated by light. Um, so this was a good test that we do not need um, a metal electrode in, in the device to, for, for working, uh, which is a good news because otherwise uh, uh, it could be impossible to make this, uh, or maybe you need encapsulation if you want to go in a biological environment. So we got rid of the metal electrode. The other thing is flexibility. I thought, uh, um, what we call flexible in, in the photovoltaic field was, was, enough, was soft enough. And I was totally wrong because the retina is an extremely soft material. So indeed at the end, uh, we use uh, a silk as a substrate because that is uh, uh, compatible and soft enough to go in, in, the, in the retina. So you see here is a time lapse of the, no, it's a time course, a time uh, um, development of the, of our, research. So first we grew cell on top of a polymer, polyfree exit thiophene, you see here the monomer, and we test, say we discover that uh, say in sending light to the polymer, the cell on top, uh, these are neurons where at the beginning were neurons and then other kind of cells, they respond to light. But usually cells are transparent. So the polymer is able to transduce light into a bioelectrical signal. That was the main, the first uh, main result that was moving us towards this application. <clears throat> so we were able to build uh, functional interfaces enabling abiotic-biotic coupling uh, towards uh, uh, application in, uh, in, li in life uh, machine symbiosis, if you will. 
Um, then uh, the second experiment we did uh, uh, was uh, the, the test to test uh, our system with explanted retinas. And you see here in, in this drawing an, an explanted retina that is the positive of the polymer. And then we were shining light and we could see that uh, uh, we could control the, you see here, the um, spontaneous activity of the ganglion cells and by using light. So when, when there is light, there is a different behavior. From these, we went to the planar interface, which is this, made of silk uh, as a substrate, which we implanted in, in the animal. Now, in spite of being, having good results, I should say that um, the surgery was rather cumbersome and the, uh, the, the output yield was not very high with this kind of uh, surgery. We had to implant the, the whole uh, object is, is large like a stamp, so it's a few millimeters square might be smaller than a stamp, few millimeters square, but anyway, still, the, the surgery was difficult. The coverage of the retina was small, and uh, uh, also the space resolution was apparently not very high, not very good. So we decided to move from this to uh, another uh, um, approach, which is the, the use of nanoparticle. It, there is a, 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 a knowledge in, in between that I'm, I'm not, uh, say, I just tell you now here, and is the following. At some point, we, realize that we do not need uh, the substrate, that we do not need an electrode at the bottom of the device in order to get uh, the bioelectrical stimulation. So that's very important because getting rid of this means that we can just use the polymer. And so that's why we move to a simple uh, nanoparticle made by P3HT. And that's the main topic of today. So it was going fast because I want to talk about this uh, new recent application. Um, the way we produce nanoparticle is uh, uh, the reprecipitation method, in which uh, uh, in a good solvent you add uh, a what is called a bad solvent. So there are uh, hydrophobic reaction, and the, the polymer escape uh, the bad solvent. Here was water, and it, it start to aggregate. And uh, changing the concentration, you can, to some extent, control the size of the nanoparticle that are obtained. You can get rid of the solvent that is something not uh, biofriendly by uh, centrifugation and uh, filtering of, uh, say, dialysis. So we try, to, we, as, as much as possible, we get rid of the solvent and we obtain nanoparticle with a diameter which is in the order of a few hundred nanometers. It apparently is not so critical as. I mean, it should be larger than a uh, few hundred. And uh, you see here that the absorption and the emission uh, spectra is uh, this comparison nanoparticle and uh, film and, 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 and nanoparticle is, is quite, quite similar. So uh, at the end, what we obtain is something that uh, uh, behave pretty much like a, a polythiophene in solid state. And uh, now when we add the nanoparticle to cell in, in a culture, here is in uh, uh, in neuron on, on the right, here where is the pointer, uh, you see that the nanoparticles with neuron, at, say they decorate the membrane, but they do not get internalized. That's a very important result that mainly comes from two reasons. One is the characteristic of the neurons that are not uh, particularly keen to internalize thing. And the other thing is the, the size of the, the nanoparticle and uh, probably the surface charge, which is favoring uh, um, this uh, um, docking to the membrane and without internalization. Uh, the other thing that is, uh, I think, very suggest say suggestive, interesting, is the, the comparison with the picture on the left. Now, the picture on the left, this one, uh, is the, an, an image of uh, using a staining dye. Uh, but uh, is a mean image of biological synapse. So these are the natural synapse of the neuron. And you see that the, the distribution of nanoparticle uh, docking, at the, say, uh, to, to, to the membrane on the right, looks pretty much like the distribution of synapse on the left. So what we claim here is that our nano photovoltaic nanoparticle behave like or establish artificial synapses that stimulate the neuron. And there are hundreds of nanoparticles in neurons. Now, uh, what we do in a nutshell is the following. We operate on uh, uh, animals that are genetically modified and develop retinitis pigmentosa. So when born, the animal has a visual acuity, which is in the order of 0.9, and then it loses visual acuity in about one year and become totally blind. 
After three months, uh, it would be already legally blind, but it's still, say, the animal is, uh, uh, okay, so it's just half of the visual acuity. So typically at month three, we operate the animal. And at month four and month 11, we test uh, the, uh, the, the visual response, the, the behavior and the, the response of the animal. The surgery is done by Grazia Pertile. She's a medical doctor working on a human patient in a hospital, and she finds some time to come and operate on, on our rat. Um, the, so the scheme of the approach is the following. Assume that this is the retina, assume that degradation is occurring, the generation is occurring, and uh, then the, the layer of the photoreceptor disappears. Essentially, you do not see them anymore. They, they, when the disease starts, they disappear. Then what we do is we inject a nanoparticle in the, in, to, in the place of the photoreceptors. So in the subretinal place. And then we go to test uh, the result. Uh, in, in this other picture cartoon, <clears throat> uh, you see the, again, the operation. So the needle of the syringe that is pouring a nanoparticle in the subretinal space. And then this nanoparticle, um, start to attach and say decorate the, you know, the membrane of the bipolar cell, which are a special kind of neurons. And uh, when light comes, say it comes from this side, uh, the, there is stimulation and coupling. Uh, in this picture here on, on the left, here you see uh, in a better drawing how the operation is done. So we, the, the surgeon uh, cut the sclera and the choroid and then there is, uh, it opens <clears throat> initially a pocket with a viscoelastic liquid that is helping the injection of our suspension. And then uh, uh, the eye is closed. And uh, there is a sort of uh, um, pressing effect that uh, uh, like a sort of, no, it's not a vacuum, but it's, uh, it's an adhesion of the tissue that keep the nanoparticle in places. You see that the optical tomography um, shows a perfect retina. So the retina is fully reattached and uh, uh, it, the nanoparticles stay there over time. So uh, what we can say is that after eight months, uh, they are, the nanoparticles are still there and they are still working. And uh, the coverage of the retina is now in the order of 70, 80%. So it's much, much larger than what we had with the uh, planar prosthesis. Uh, now, we do many tests uh, in order to establish the visual response of the animal. And, but here, I'm gonna show you only two of them. Uh, the first one is uh, the pupillary reflex, because this is a very, um, I think, uh, intuitive and simple experiment. And uh, now here you see that when we shine light, uh, the pupil uh, becomes smaller, right? So there is a constrict constriction that is very common, so we know it. Uh, we did an experiment with four different kinds of samples. Those uh, animals that are, uh, say, healthy, is the blue data. Uh, those animals that are uh, affected by the disease is the green one. The animals that have been operated with, the, uh, with glass nanoparticle, just as a sham operation, this is to test uh, uh, that uh, indeed is not a natural response that we are looking at. So for say surviving photoreceptors, for instance, are the same when you put glass nanoparticle or our nanoparticle. So if surviving photoreceptors are responsible, uh, the, also this experiment should give a, an answer, it doesn't. Um, and then in red, you see our operating animals. And you see very well that uh, we are able to rescue pupillary reflex almost completely. Uh, when we repeat the experiment eight months later, uh, the, the, the response is even better. So the, you see that the overlap between operated and healthy animal is perfect, while non-operated or sham operated animal are down here. So again, this demonstrates that it's not just the surgery technique that is inducing a change, because uh, otherwise with the glass particle, we should have an answer. And I tell you this kind of thing, because this is one of the criticism that we receive from our competitor developing a silicon-based uh, prosthesis, they say, uh, by opening and closing the eye is enough uh, to reestablish some visual response, and but that's not true. And uh, then they claim it, what we have is uh, the response of the surviving photoreceptor, and that's not true as well because it would be the same with the glass nanoparticle. If you ask, say, if you think why there is anyway a response here, well, that's because melanopsin is a photoreceptor uh, that is not uh, in, the, in the retina, is not uh, degenerated by. It is pigmentosa, 
uh, and uh, it is associated to the uh, circadian rhythm and uh, uh, is what we when, when you feel in, in the jet lag for instance the, the timing uh, the clock the biological clock so it's something that has nothing to do with vision but it's still associated to the pupillary reflex now how we measure visual acuity uh, so visual acuity is the ability to see details and is what you uh, usually measure in the in the optometrist or in the optician lab uh, by reading letters of course with this animal you can do something different that let's take the approach you show to the animal a pattern of uh, stripes and uh, measuring at the same time the visual evoke potential coming from the visual cortex so it's an electrical signal coming from the visual cortex in the brain that corresponds to the signaling of the retina that distinguishes the pattern now as high as the the frequency of the pattern become higher so that the lines become thinner and thinner the signal is uh, um, in the visual evoke potential is decaying uh, until it goes to zero. And the space frequency at which uh, the zero is reached is uh, defining the visual acuity. So for these animals, uh, uh, is uh, in, for our strain of animals, this one here is less than one. And these are because this animal cannot see very well. And so that, that's what we have, unfortunately, in the lab. And that's what we can do. Um, now, you see here the situation for the operation. The healthy animal is about 0.8 visual acuity, while the uh, at month three, when we do the, uh, or at month four, say when we test the animal, the, the visual acuity is reduced below 0.4. Okay, so that's that's the uh, genetically modified rat. Uh, RCS means Royal College of Surgeons is the, the company that is producing this kind of genetically modified strain. Now, when we measure animal that has been implanted with our nanoparticle, we find a full recovery of visual acuity. So this is much more than what I showed you before. It's not just the ability, it's, the, the, it's not just light sensitivity. This is the ability to see details. This is the closest thing we can define in having, say, a dealing with, with the rat to, to real vision. Uh, and you, you notice, uh, it doesn't escape your notice that you see using glass nanoparticle, there's no this effect. So whatever the other things may occur, they are not responsible for this effect. If we wait eight months and the, the generation of the photoreceptor is complete at this point, and you see that even the healthy animal, there is a loss of uh, visual acuity uh, due just to aging. And, but with our uh, operation, we can still rescue almost completely the visual acuity in the animal. Okay, so that's that's the main result. Now, there is one uh, main uh, observation here that is important to be done, and it's the following. If you, we operate, you operate at month four, at month four, the surviving retina layers, the ones that are not affected by the disease, uh, so these are the um, horizontal cell, let's say bipolar cell, horizontal cell, amacrine cell, ganglion cell, all these layers, they have a specific network and pattern connection. Uh, those are uh, still in, in the right position. Um, of course, if you wait and you do the operation, uh, say after one year, there is a full uh, um, disarray of the retina because when the, the layers of the retina do not receive the signal anymore for a long time, they lose their organization. So it's a good question uh, um, to, as to look at what happened if we do the operation at month 10, 11, when the animal is totally blind and the retina has totally lost uh, its function. So that's what we did, because that's also the situation that probably is occurring for human patients that will be operated when they are totally blind, which may be after 10, 20, even 50 years of, uh, of the disease, because it depends. I mean, there are people that degenerate quickly and other that takes much longer. So we did the operation uh, at month 10, when the animal is totally blind, as I showed you before, and the retina is totally in disarray, it's totally disorganized. And then uh, in the, the, the following month, we were testing with many different experiments the visual acuity and the visual uh, properties. So I, I didn't mention other experiments, but we do light and box say behavior. So we look at the animal, how it's moving. We do a number of tests. At the end, uh, the tissue are uh, also um, investigated from the histological point of view. 
And uh, here is the most uh, important result. What you see here is that even after, uh, even operating at month 11, uh, we still recover visual acuity. Uh, now, here you, you, you notice again that the, the recovery this time is not as good as before. So it's not complete. It's, um, it's uh, but it's more than half, but it's not complete. Uh, so that could be a consequence of the, um, the reorganization of the retinal layers. Uh, it may take time to, to improve the, uh, the, the, the properties. Anyway, it's, it's the result. And uh, you should appreciate also that to do this experiment is very difficult because aging animals do not support anesthesia very well. And so that's the reason why we were delaying this experiment. Okay, now what about the optostimulation mechanism? Uh, we propose a mechanism. We think we understood how things are going. First of all, uh, we exclude the, the phototropic effect. That means the ability of our polymer to regrow uh, photoreceptor or stop the generation. Now, this is, sounds more like um, magic because there are no real good reason why this polymer should, should do something like this. But anyway, it was a criticism. We took into account and we went to look at the surviving photoreceptor. And indeed, what you see here is very clear. For each population, these are statistically um, meaningful data as anyone that I show you. So there are always 10, 20 samples for each uh, set of data. Um, you see here that uh, the number of photoreceptor in the, uh, the generated animal, the operated with our particle, with the operated with the glass particle are the same, and they're all very low after one month or after a month. So there's no recovery of the photoreceptors. Um, now, the, again, the criticism came that we are not able to, we are not uh, say, yeah, we are not able, we don't know how to measure the, to count the photoreceptor. That was a criticism that we, we received. Um, now, while I do not comment on, on the kind of, this kind of uh, criticism that are, I think I'm fair, but anyway, uh, so say, let's forget about this. Uh, let's assume that we, we are still not convinced that we did this experiment. I call this experimentum crucis. It's, uh, it's a term that uh, I think um, uh, Hook uh, was uh, proposing uh, uh, as it means, it's the smoking gun for the American. It means uh, the experiment that pinned down specifically uh, a result. Um, now, uh, you see here three, three things. The animal photo, rat photoreceptor, which you think is start uh, below 600 nanometer wavelength. Uh, the absorption of the polymer, the polyphy 3 exit thiophene, it start uh, at 670 nanometer and below. And the light, the spectrum of the light that we are using, which is centered at 630 nanometer. Um, you, now, I think you understood what we are aiming to. It's very clear, but I, uh, now uh, so quickly I tell you, obviously, the point is uh, the animal cannot see red light. It cannot see this kind of red light, while the polymer is perfectly absorbing at that uh, wavelength. It's maybe half of the peak, but it's still a very large absorption. You may notice that the sensitivity of the animal is order of is smaller, so it's not really zero, but it's two order minus smaller. So you, on this scale, you don't see it. And when we did the experiment, the only set of animals that could be, that was able to respond to red light is the operated one, is the one with our nanoparticles. Now, of course, the, this experiment is done in order to demonstrate that the nanoparticles are responsible for the biological response. In the, in the visual cortex. So there is a visual evoked potential coming from the uh, response of the nanoparticle. Is, this is not to make a super rat that escape in the night. Uh, it's, it's not, that, that's not the goal. Uh, I understand that people can think to make application that we are not really interested to. Uh, but anyway, what we aim here is function um, rescue, not, not function gain. OK. Um, so we think the nanoparticle is responsible for the stimulation. And then we, we, we started, before proposing the mechanism, we were looking at all possibility, and we came out with four possible different mechanisms. One is electrostatic, that means we accumulate charges there, and those charges are changing 
the uh, voltage, uh, the membrane voltage and the, the electrical equilibrium of the cell. Or we can, it can be resistive, that means we inject the current that is going through its force through the tissues. It, there should be an electrode and a counter electrode. And uh, this is what is done with silicon. So silicon usually has a metal electrode that is injecting a current and there is a collecting electrode that is a current path. And then through this resistive path, the, the cell is stimulated. It can be a thermal effect because we pour energy in the eye. And if you actually in vitro, it's very easy to induce uh, opto uh, thermal responses. And uh, finally, it can be chemical because any time you photoexcite anything in, bio in a biological environment uh, where there is oxygen around, of course, there are production of chemical species like the active oxygen species. Uh, the first thing to exclude is very simple, easy, is the thermal effect because we evaluate the, the light that is coming on the retina, and this light is something that stays between one microvat square centimeter to 10 millivat square centimeter, depending on the experiment that we are doing. And uh, this is also, it turns out to be uh, the energy that is uh, typically reaching the retina in a, uh, say, average uh, illuminator room. Here you see some order of magnitude of the light from one lux to uh, 100,000 lux, which is actually blinding the, um, uh, the eye. If you stare at the sun, for instance, in a clear day, you, your retina is receiving 10 watt square centimeters. Same thing that for sure is, uh, is not recommended. And uh, Newton did this. Uh, it was, say, staring at the eye, at the sun, as long as he could bear, and so uh, he ended up to be blinded. Then he had to stay three days in a fully darkened room until his retina, uh, say, forgave him for, for what he did. Uh, so this tells you that Newton was a very brave man uh, trying on himself things and experiments. So now, now uh, because this is the amount of the highest energy that we, in our experiment, we are using uh, on the retina, uh, you see that it's still two order of magnitude smaller than the minimum energy to get the thermal effect. So we think we can exclude the thermal effect, and which makes a lot of sense because it cannot be thermal in general. But anyway, so it is excluded. The other thing that we can exclude is the resistive path because we don't have enough current uh, uh, charge to support the current. We don't have a counter electrode. So we get rid of these two and we end up with these two mechanisms that probably are both playing a role. The electrostatic effect and the uh, chemical effect. Um, now, uh, let me talk now about the, the, the interface between the polymer and the nanoparticle, uh, the polymer and sorry, and the, the polymer nanoparticle and the, the cell, which is very peculiar because you see the real innovation here, the no novelty, is the peculiar interface that we establish between the abiotic part, the organic molecule, and the biotic part, the biological molecule. Sometimes I say organic bio interface, which is uh, stretching a bit terminology because uh, any biological molecule is organic. But anyway, organic bio interfaces send a message. Uh, this interface is the heart of the disease, and it's a peculiar thing that you cannot do with inorganic material. Uh, the first thing we notice is that uh, following detailed calculation done by this uh, green team of theoretician is that uh, uh, the presence of the electrolytic solution in contact with the polymer is reducing the frontier orbital energy. So it is favoring accumulation of a negative charge on the surface. And this is a full, it's, it's a quantum mechanical calculation. So it's one of the effects, it's not the only one. The other thing I like to, to mention here is again the, the interface. Now, the interface uh, has been evaluated, for instance, measuring the much shot T plot. It's in the order of 20 nanometers. So that means we are not talking about a, a flat 2D uh, surface that is the interface. Here we are talking about an interpenetrated region uh, in which the polymer, the water, the protein, and all the ions are mixed together. So there are about 20 nanometers in which the polymer is swelling and the water is going in. And so the electric function is changing. Oxygen is making a complex with the polymer. It's becoming a trap for the negative charge. And it is uh, a, it, it's a strongly uh, charge transfer state that is formed in, in the polymer due to the oxygen penetration. Uh, you see that the surface is changing because, for instance, the hydrophobicity of the polymer, once it is in contact with water and light, this data here, 
or even just in, 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 uh, in water, uh, you see that, um, or, or in light, so there is a big change and uh, uh, the hydrophobicity is reduced. So the contact angle is uh, uh, reduced. Um, so uh, this suggests uh, uh, that the, the, the role of the interface. Um, now, let me start this, say, uh, in the nanoparticle, there is a combination of two different morphologies. There is an amorphous morphology of the polymer, which is absorbing a higher energy. And there is a crystalline morphology, which is absorbing a lower energy. And this is the fitting of the absorption spectrum. Most of the time, when we look at nanoparticle, we need to add the tail of states to reproduce the absorption, and which is not fully uh, explained, but I think is, uh, is due to the, the surface and the presence of just transfer states at the number of uh, uh, modulation of the transition energy due to the interaction with the environment which is stronger at the surface. Now, what's interesting here that when we pump uh, with the light uh, pulse here, which is uh, exciting, stimulating both the amorphous and the crystalline part, what we see is only bleaching of the crystalline part. And we also see that in time, this bleaching is moving toward lower energy. So this uh, it, it means that uh, following excitation, the energy quickly go to the crystalline part which is organized in, a, in an excitonic structure. So there are uh, delocalized states and uh, eventually goes to the surface states at lower energy. So you see this shift of the excitation is called spectral migration. The other interesting thing is that you measure, if you measure uh, up to almost half a micron, you see that there is a 10% of the population, the excited state population that survive very long time. So here, after 400 nanoseconds, all the singular excited states are gone for sure. So they can be triple state or charged charge state, say charge carriers. And uh, then uh, we uh, look back at an uh, experiment done by the group of Arden in Utah. And you see, he was comparing the amorphous regiorandum polymer to the regiorregular crystalline polymer. And uh, he was able to measure the spin of the long leaf of excitation. And now, without going into detail, uh, I'll tell you here that from, from this experiment with the magnetic field, uh, he, he could conclude that in the amorphous part, there are mainly triple state surviving on the long time scale, while in the crystalline part, which is the one that we are effectively exciting, there are only charged states surviving, spin one half. So um, comparing our uh, samples, so these are nanoparticles, this is a uh, uh, a film made by nanoparticles deposited on a substrate, you see that this spectrum is very similar to this spectrum. And uh, this one is the spectrum measured by Bardet in Utah associated to uh, the charged species. So what we conclude is that we generate mainly long leave charge states. And now let me go to the, uh, to the mechanism. Uh, um, if uh, the my PowerPoint is in stock, very good, which is something occurring once in a while. I'm afraid I need to restart the program. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Be patient. I'll res rescue it. I don't know why. I think it's a problem with the. Uh, it's a problem with the. Laser pointer. Uh, all right, uh, almost done. Uh, almost done. Yes, so that's the next slide. Here we go. Um, so you see, we we did the experiment with, in an electrochemical cell. Uh, now you can complain with me. You can say, "But well, this is a, is a totally different situation." Well, I tell you, yes, it is a different situation, but it tells you, it tells us a lot uh, about the interface that is working in the device. So here we have an electrolytic solution uh, with uh, um, ions inside, and uh, we have uh, um, sodium chloride. So it's the easiest uh, uh, model for the intracell, uh, intercell uh, medium. And uh, we have P3ST, which is the working electrode. There is a counter electrode and a reference electrode as usual. And uh, we measure the open circuit voltage. So there is no current going through, okay? 
Now, if we shine light from the electrolyte side, is this uh, on, on the on the on this side? I try again to use the point. Uh, hopefully, now this is the uh, from the electrolyte side. We see a positive photovoltage at the ITO. When we do the experiment on the neg, sorry, on the ITO side, when so we shine light on the ITO side, we see a negative photovoltage. However, the negative photovoltage in time evolved towards a positive signal. It turns positive only if the sample is, uh, say, is um, uh, narrow enough. So if the thickness is small enough, otherwise uh, it's thin, it's thin enough. If it is too thick, uh, it, it tries, but it, can, it doesn't have time during the illumination to turn sun. So we develop a model, and you see here on the right, before I tell you the detail of the model, you see that we can reproduce very well uh, the, um, uh, the, the experimental data. Right? So we see the photovoltage and the time dynamic of the photovoltage when we illuminate from the electrolyte side and from the other side. Now, the model is the following. So we, uh, in, in the polymer, we consider the charge generation and the recombination. Uh, uh, and the current of the charge carriers, which are in these two equations here. And then we consider the Poisson equation for uh, uh, the field. So we take into account that there is an electrical field and this field is affected by the charge generation process and by the charge motion. So it's a, it's a drift diffusion equation that we are using with a boundary condition that takes into account on the left, uh, the situation at the ITO, and we assume that uh, uh, charges are not entering uh, the, uh, the ITO. And uh, uh, on the right, uh, we, we assume that there is an electron transfer to oxygen, which is in the electrolyte. And in order to reproduce the rate of the electron transfer, we, um, uh, we uh, use the Marcus Gerische equation, the Marcus Gerische model, to describe uh, electron transfer. So that's, uh, that's the, it's the model. So it's a uh, advanced drift diffusion equation. And uh, you see here again, uh, uh, the, um, the, uh, the drift diffusion term and the uh, continuity equation, uh, the Poisson equation. So there is everything, there is a time molecular recombination taken into account. There is a, a charge generation efficiency that uh, generate about uh, 10 to the minus four uh, quantum yield uh, charge carriers. So we assume the light generate electron and holes, say positive and negative polarons, and uh, with, a, with an efficiency of 10 to the minus four. Now, the other ingredient that we put in this model is that uh, the mobility of the electron is essentially zero. So the, the negative charges are essentially fixed, while the holes are extremely mobile. When you have this kind of asymmetry, what happens due to the lambert beer profile, which established a space gradient, is that diffusion is efficiently redistributing the positive charge everywhere in the field, while the negative charge does not move. So the illuminated surface will keep the sign of the negative charge, because from there, the negative charge is not moving. So that's why illuminated on one side or the other, you change the sign of the photovoltage. Um, the other uh, say, thing to, be, to consider is that the negative charge is interacting with oxygen easily and that water is uh, also helping this hydrating the charges. So we have polarons uh, which are formed in this uh, um, diffuse interface in which the polymer is mixed with island of water, uh, oxygen, hydrated oxygen, superoxide. So it, it becomes a system. So this, this, uh, this part is the heart of our device. Um, because there, has, there is this unbalance in the transport property and the negative charge does not move, the result of the photo excitation is a polarization of the field because uh, uh, the positive charge is spreading around while the negative charge does not move. And you see here that negative charge blue remain while red, the positive charge, is building up on the rest of the movie. So if you sit here with your electrode and you illuminate on the other side, you will find a positive signal. 
if you illuminate the other way around, so in other terms, if you read on this side, uh, of course, you will read a negative photovoltage. And that's what our simulation is reproducing very well. Here you see the distribution of the charges. Blue is negative, red in, is positive. And uh, um, you see also why in a thin a sample, uh, there is uh, enough uh, time uh, for uh, the uh, far away interface to become dominant, while in a, um, in a thick sample, this cannot occur when we shine light from the ITO side. When we shine light from the electrolyte side, uh, we are in this situation. And of course, the negative uh, charge here is predominant. So there will be negative here and positive here, which is what we see. In the simulation. So this model uh, reproduced very well what is going on in the film. And now we did the 2D simulation, which of course is mathematically more challenging. And this 2D simulation again is reproducing the same polarization effect due to the asymmetric transport. Note that um, at the beginning I thought I was discovering a new phenomenon, this uh, transport induced uh, polarization. Uh, but then uh, it turns out that it's not as easy. So Denver was already talking about this phenomenon in the 1930s. So it's a well-known phenomenon occurring at the, uh, at the semiconductor interfaces. Uh, you see here what happens when you shine light from the bottom, for instance, in a nanoparticle. And uh, there is a profile which is bending a bit on this direction. As here you see very well. And it's easy to uh, in understand uh, uh, why it's occurring as this, no? because the negative charge does not move. And uh, so the penetration is the same. Of course, if you come on this side, you go more inside with the negative charge than here. And so anyway, this is the distribution. So you see that the, our nanoparticle under light becomes like a dipole. And uh, if light comes from the bottom, that would be the position of the dipole. And now this dipole can affect uh, a neuron nearby. And that is the mechanism that we think is the major responsible for the stimulation of the, of the neuron. Uh, the uh, polarization uh, induced, uh, say, the dipole field is affecting electrostatically the uh, equilibrium of the nearby adjacent neuron. But, but there is an important uh, detail, well, it's not a detail, there is an important uh, ingredient that we should still consider. Now let's assume light come from, from the left and it is generating this dipole as we saw. Okay, then uh, uh, the dipole has certain line fields or so line force in the, the space and uh, that's the, the, the filter. Uh, now, if there are ions around, those ions uh, will, be, uh, will move and uh, uh, screen the field. So the negative charge will appear here and the positive charge will appear here. And they will screen the field with, within a distance, which is given by the divide distance. And the divide distance for this, uh, um, this concentration of ions is uh, extremely small. We are talking about a few nanometers. Uh, so uh, that's, uh, the, uh, that's the situation. I mean, if you have a, a dipole as this, and uh, it's, it's close to the, to the nanoparticle, well, still ions are going to screen everything, how, how, say, what's going on here? Well, the, the suggestion uh, are uh, come and come from this uh, simple, uh, say, some suggestion come from this uh, additional simulation calculations. It's still a 2D simulation in which we put the uh, nanoparticle in an environment with the dielectric function of 80 or a dielectric function of 6. Well, of course, it's very easy to understand that when the dielectric function is 6, the potential and the, the field, uh, this is potential is, is extending much more than when the, the electric function is 80. So it means a screening environment as water would confine the electrostatic coupling. But if there is a dielectric, the electrostatic coupling is expanding on a much larger range. Now, what is the situation for us uh, for the coupling of our um, particle? This is, the, is a cell, so let's assume it's a neuron, a bipolar cell, and in orange is the nanoparticle. And what you see with the red arrows is the current path through the cleft, which is the space in between the particle and the cell. 
And uh, now, why do I picture like this? The, 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 the thing is that because I saw this picture from the, electro, the electronic microscope, you see that the uh, membrane is engulfing the nanoparticle without internalizing it. And uh, so the cleft is extremely small, and we, have, we are dealing with a sort of a spherical shell of thickness delta, which is the uh, current path that can lead, bring the ions to the top of the particle, to the pole, in order to screen the charge. Now, how much is this delta? Well, that depends on the estimation, but it's something below 30 nanometer. So it's extremely small. And what is the resistivity of the medium inside the cleft? So in this spherical uh, cleft uh, gap in between, no? this shell that is forming, well, that is the resistivity of proteins, because a particle in, in a biological medium is going to be uh, covered by um, a protein corona, which, is, which may establish island of proteins that uh, then establish a dielectric coupling. So the result is the following. This is a simple equation here, a simple calculation of the resistance of this geometry here and uh, uh, the ohm law, okay? and, and you see that the, the, the electrical resistance depends on the resistivity of the medium and inverse dependence on the thickness. So because the thickness is very small and the resistivity of a protein medium is very high, we expect that the electrical resistance here to be very high, which means that the nanoparticle is establishing a giga seal with the cell. And now, if you do the calculation of the membrane depolarization due to the electrostatic effect, uh, what you see here is that increasing the concentration of proteins, you go higher in, in here from green to orange, uh, you see that the depolarization become much larger. So you can gain several order of magnitude increasing uh, the um, protein concentration just by two order of magnitude. And in particular, in, in this, this is the range of the uh, uh, optical application. You see that you can reach almost one millivolt uh, depolarization for one nanoparticle if there are proteins in the cleft. So to sum up, if there is this highly resistive cleft, then the electrostatic effect is very efficient. Um, the other thing you see here is that, um, they, of course, the proteins do not have much effect on the in light intensity dependence and the concentration of the, uh, say, regarding the concentration of, of two minus of superoxide, which we consider can still uh, diffuse in, in, the, um, in, in the cleft. Uh, uh, the CO2 minus, however, becomes important for, so it starts to grow uh, for, with the light intensity. And uh, for the highest light intensity we are considering here, it is still uh, 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 below the nanomolar concentration, nanomolar. Now, we, of course, we were considering the possibility that reactive oxygen species uh, reach uh, close to the membrane and can induce chemical interaction, affect the change in the, um, uh, say, affecting some ion channel that could be, uh, say, sensi sensible to this. And, but now, uh, the, um, according to our investigation, the minimum concentration that gives an effect is in the micromolar uh, region, while we are unable to go beyond the nanomolar concentration, even for the high, uh, very high uh, light intensity, which becomes uh, too high for the retina. So we think we can exclude the role of uh, superoxide and oxygen, hydrogen peroxide, uh, say hydrogen uh, peroxide, uh, or to, um, as, as a sensitive uh, medium. So at the end, the mechanism is the following. The nanoparticle establishes a giga seal with the membrane of the cell, which is due to uh, extend, say, proteins that are forming on the surface of the protein, of the, of the nanoparticle, and proteins that are extruded from the membrane. So both these fill up the, the cleft, and uh, the dielectric function here is much smaller than the water dielectric function. As a, as a result, uh, the low conductivity means uh, low ion concentration and uh, no screening, so it hampers the screening. And then the electric field established by the polarization on this side can be fed by, can affect the, the protein equilibrium. 
um, to conclude that we, we want to bring this result to human. It, to do this, you, so it's, it's a challenge that goes beyond uh, the ability of uh, the, the know-how of the, of, the, of the researcher in, in academia. So we start, say, we found, we launch a, a startup. It's called Nova Vido. Uh, together with Fabio Benfenati, my major partner in crime, he's a neuroscientist. We are founders, and Giovanni Manfredi is our CEO. And the main, uh, I mean, there are a number of uh, funding uh, um, agency and uh, support, say, fund, say, 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 financial supporter. But the main contribution comes from Alpha Sigma. Alpha Sigma is a big uh, uh, pharma company, and so they, in principle, they should have all the know-how to bring uh, the, uh, this technology to human. There are many other uh, funding agencies that we should uh, thanks, uh, but most uh, again, I'd like to thank you all for the attention. And uh, once again, thank you to the organizing committee board uh, for the very kind invitation. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Prof. Lazani. So now we move on to the Q&A session. So for the audience, if you have any questions, please feel free to put it in the Q&A box. So first, actually, we have some questions uh, as discussed last, last time. So first, uh, I would like to ask that, is there, any, is there going to be any color distortion when you inject those kind of nanoparticles into mm -hmm. human patients per se? Because I yeah. you so, said you have red colors, right? As I mentioned. Yeah, no, that, that's, that's a very good question. Uh, indeed, uh, you probably not know, say, understand that what we are doing is, uh, what we are providing is black and white vision because we have, we have only one kind of photosetter. Uh, it would be very easy to inject a free uh, different nanoparticle that has slightly different optical gap and see different colors, but that's not the main issue, right? Because the problem is, uh, what is the brain doing? Uh, well, for sure, we cannot uh, reestablish the original wiring of red, green, and blue uh, to red and green and blue bipolar cells. I mean, that's out of, out of question. And it's impossible to be done. Uh, what I think interesting is that the plasticity of the brain could allow the patient to relearn, in a way, from scratch, uh, how to distinguish colors, having different photoreceptors in the retina. So that's uh, it's a bit of, uh, say, fantasy for sure, uh, but maybe it's something that could, uh, it could occur. So far, uh, we uh, provide black and white vision. Got it. Thank you. Uh, Jishin, do you have a question? I see that there are questions in the... Uh, yes, so uh, I, I have one question. Uh, is, is there uh, a requirement to sort of upgrade or change these nanoparticles based on the degradation of performance from time to time? Mm -hmm. Okay, now... Uh... An interesting upgrade uh, we are thinking at uh, is the, uh, it would be the biological, the specific targeting of uh, molecules because the retina is, is, is very complicated, as you know, and there is an on and off path uh, that uh, is established at level of um, bipolar cell. And so there are two kinds of bipolar cell. And uh, from these, uh, these, uh, on and off path goes to the all the way to the visual cortex. It's important to for, for having a good contrast. So probably to improve the quality of the retina prosthesis, one should be able to uh, reconstruct, reestablish the physiological mechanism distinguishing between on and off. In order to do this, you need to be uh, specific in uh, docking uh, uh, the, the bipolar cell. It's something that optogenetics try to do, uh, but Optogenetics have other problems. So at the end, the result was not really um, successful, uh, satisfying, but uh, so it's still something we, we can try to, to think to do. So that, that would be the major, I think, in, in improvement. In terms of efficiency, um, you saw that in the old animal, uh, the recall, the rescue is not complete. So, the, probably uh, if we could uh, change the polymer and having some nanoparticles is more efficient, uh, that would help in, in this situation. Okay, thank you, thank you. The first mm -hmm. question he asks is, uh, did, you, did you observe any nanotoxicity in the retina? 
Yeah, well, uh, fortunately, no. Uh, there is an inflammatory response that is occurring just after the, the operation, the surgery. But this inflammation reaction, which is typical of the operation, I usually uh, go back in about one month. And uh, up, up to uh, one year, say almost, we do not see any particular um, reaction. So it looks like, say, remember that the eye is a secluded area region volume, which is not uh, uh, very reactive. So you should not think like uh, rejection when you transplant an organ. So that's much more demanding. The eye is not, uh, doesn't have the, the same immune response that has the rest of the body. All right. Uh, his second question is, uh... Considering neuronal and other toxicities that nanomaterial could cause, and they're not fully known short-term and long-term impacts, when and if you think this will be applicable to human patients? Right, yeah. So as I said, we think we can go on human. We propose, uh, so we will propose uh, to the ministry the, for the regulatory path for the uh, approval. Uh, in, in terms of, say, of course, we don't know it, but in the long term, I mean, here, honestly, we don't know. I mean, we, we work on animals for up to one month, up to, sorry, one year. And so that, that's, uh, that's the long, but what we have so far. Uh, what we know and what we can test uh, is in the lab uh, is that the nanoparticles do not uh, diffuse around. So they apparently they stay where they, where they are put at the beginning, uh, so which is very important. So they don't go out of the eye. The vascular system will not be able to transport uh, such nanoparticles that are too large. So in, it seems to be a, a relatively safe situation in which the nanoparticle stays in the eye. Okay. Uh, Vivek has a question. Vivek, can you go ahead? Uh, hi, Professor. Thank you very much for your talk. It was very interesting to see how uh, retina can be brought back to life using nanoparticles. I have two questions for you. Like, I think one of them, you've already kind of answered it about the long-term effects. Um, so I I'd like to ask, are there any assumptions that you're making currently in, in your animal trials that you hope will also replicate in human trials, but they are assumptions as of now? Well, say... Uh, yeah, there are a number of I mean, things I didn't tell you. The, the, the animal, the, the rat we are using, do not have a fovea. And uh, they have a very low um, visual acuity. As I, I show you, it's less than one, so one, say. Uh, we have uh, about 30. So a human being has about 30. Uh, and we have a macular and a fovea. So uh, we are assuming that when going to the human, we assume that the same effect will be still beneficial to human. But of course, uh, what we demonstrate is the rescue to a visual acuity, which for a human would be nothing. So one is too low. So the hope is that uh, because in principle, we have a very high resolution. If you consider the size of the nanoparticle, the coverage, we, we have a, a space resolution that should be similar to the, the natural one. In, we hope we, we are able to rescue uh, enough visual acuity. Uh, we are also working on pigs because pigs uh, have, uh, are much more similar to human and they have uh, a, a streak, which is not a phobia, but it's, uh, it's a stripe in the retina, which has a high concentration of cones. So it's something more similar. So the assumption here that the, the, the bet is that uh, uh, this, say, not poor, say the, the, yeah, say the poorest performance of the rat will be enhanced when we go to human. Hopefully. Thanks, Professor. And uh, just to follow up on uh, on the question related to toxicity, so you said uh, there was some inflammation observed in the retina after injecting mm -hmm. the nanoparticles. Was there any study done to see if any of the existing cells are damaged or are they completely being replaced by the nanoparticles? So how how is it working? Uh, no, well, it seems that the nanoparticles, when we do histological studies, it looks like the nanoparticles remain in the volume in the space uh, in the layer of the photoreceptors and uh, there's no effect on, on the other organ. Uh, of course, they don't even induce a rearrangement of the retina. So that's why I think uh, the uh, rescue with all animals is not so good uh, because the retina is already in disarray. So in, in human, probably uh, there will be this problem. So we have to understand when doing to do the operation. Um, 
but it looks like there's no other detrimental effect on the surviving cell, as far as we can say, looking at rats. Thanks, Professor. My pleasure. Professor, uh, there's one more question. Mm -hmm. uh, can this technology be extended towards people who are born blind? Just to say again, sorry. Uh, can... So uh, there's a question, can this technology be extended towards people who are born blind? Mm -hmm. Uh, born blind, you mean? Uh, who are naturally born blind, so. Ah, born blind, okay, I understand, sorry. Um, no, I think he, no, because uh, in most of, uh, because those situations are a uh, problem of the issue with the optic, uh, optic nerve. And unfortunately, our technology doesn't, and is this, in this approach doesn't do anything for the optic nerve. I mean, we assume that the optic nerve is still working. If it's not working, you replace the photoreceptor, but there is still no communication with the brain. What would be science fiction, but it has been done with optogenetics. No, so it's not science fiction, it would be say future development is uh, to go directly to stimulate uh, the visual cortex. So that's something that neuroscience in principle can do. So you do a, a, a brain implant, and you stimulate directly from a camera that is looking from outside uh, the, the visual cortex in order to reproduce the sensation of vision. It's something that has been done with optogenetic to some extent. I mean, as a proof of concept, it's very interesting. It's not what we are doing here. So for us, unfortunately, no, it's only for the generation of the photoreceptors. Okay, thank you. Uh, Vladimir has a question. Vladimir, can you go ahead? Ask the question, please. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Professor. Uh, that's a very interesting talk because it relates the nanoparticles and the uh, you know medical field. Maybe a basic question: What difference would we observe if we rather use rabbits for samples instead of rats? And what are the considerations if ever we're going to use rabbits? Mm -hmm. um, I think. In they would be a better sample, probably, but uh, it's more difficult to uh, deal with them. It, uh, it's uh, probably in Italy, it's more expensive. It's more, when I say more difficult, it means uh, from the legal and uh, uh, regulatory point of view. Uh, it's, uh, there are few animal factories that allow us uh, to use uh, rabbits. And so that, that's the main reason why we did not do. Say, let me say this straight at the end. Uh, I have uh, a line of people calling and telling me, human, say, can, can you test on me your technology? And, uh, you know, because uh, you shouldn't say, we are working at the end stage of the disease. We are talking about people that are totally blind. Sometimes they are old and they know that there are no much more hope to rescue vision. The worst thing that can happen in an operational disease is that they lose the eye, which is even, I mean, this is, is really unlikely, but the worst of the worst cases, they lose the eye. We are talking about blind people. So I don't see why we should go through animals if we get any way, uh, we never be like human, when uh, uh, working on human is a compassionate uh, um, approach that would, most of the case situation help the people. So that I think the right strategy is to go on humans. That's okay. what I think. Okay, okay. Uh, yeah. that's a good, <laughs> that's a good answer. <laughs> maybe, uh -huh. and, uh, maybe another, uh, one last question. Well, I'll extend what I have just told in the chat, in the Q&A box. I was... uh, hello, hello. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, maybe uh, I would want to ask if uh, this technology can also be applied for like damaged cornea, like cataracts, or even uh, glaucoma, other eye diseases, and why or why not? Mm -hmm. No, I think not because uh, we go to the retina, so the cornea is. Um... So the problem of the cornea can be opacity or other defects that is something that is more uh, morphology or mechanical problem we oper we we use a optoelectronic if you want to call as they say 
of the bioelectronic response. So it's not the typical damage of the cornea, which has to be transparent. And uh, so it, it's more like a mechanical and transparency problem. In about the cataract, uh, that's, that's again, it's a question of morphology of the lens and um, uh, morphology impurity that are uh, protein condensation that is formed, no? that become opaque to light. And again, so I don't see how our nanoparticle could, could help. Uh, perhaps uh, we could um, induce stimulation of the muscle around for some kind of, of, of problem of uh, eye orientation or eye accommodation. But that's, uh, I mean, that, that's uh, uh, it, it's kind of far away. In general, I think is uh, these are different kind of pathology. Glaucoma again is the pressure of the eye. You need to use some change in the uh, I would say microfluidic uh, balance of the eye, and it's not something that you do with with nan nanoparticles that are opto bioelectronics. So um, these are all disorders that need other technology. I think. Okay. Thank you. My pleasure. Uh, yeah. Hi. Hi. Informative talk. I was also wondering. Um, I'm coming from more neuroscience part, but I was wondering that if uh, the uh, brain stimulation like TMS for the, especially for the human subjects, hopefully in future when it happens, do you think that if it is applied that to V1 or the hospital cortex, that it would help with shorten the time for nanoparticles to be, uh, you know, just get into action? Because from your talk, what I understood, it just kind of with the time, actually there's more improvement, right? The, the longer the nanoparticles are there. Uh, well, yeah, that's what I what we saw, but uh, I would not bet. Uh, say uh, we don't have really solid data to say that the longer they stay there, the better they work. So uh, it, it's true. Let's say you are right. That is what we saw with the pupillary reflex. But for instance, for the visual acuity, is the other way around. So I would say uh, we have no data on, on, on this. And the difficulties here is that. Uh, uh, when we talk about uh, several months, it's already very difficult to get data. And if we talk about years, it's impossible. So as long as the disease is the situation and we don't have human patients with a long history behind, uh, I cannot say anything about this subject, I'm afraid. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. So the like, kind of problem my understanding was wrong in the sense that I thought there was something with the time, it took time for nanoparticles to work. So the more time was better, but it's actually not like that. So you are assuming as soon, like, as, soon as you apply the nanoparticle, it should actually work, right? Maybe, now say that, that's a really very good question uh, because we, we are working on this. This protein uh, um, coupling that I show might take some time. So when you do experiment in acute, for instance, in explanted retina, uh, the performance is much worse, uh, uh, but it looks like that if you wait, uh, it is improving. So maybe it's a matter of a few weeks, uh, uh, maybe a month to establish a good cone. But that, that's, I think, it, it make sense, it's reasonable. Uh, for longer time, I, I don't know. But I would say I've, I, I'm not this, 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 uh, disregarding the possibility what I tell you is that we don't have any evidence that, that it is really working. It makes sense, but uh, but I have no data to say yes, it's like this. Yes, I understand. Thank you very much. So the question in the question panel is just a curiosity. Can we apply your technology to develop a better industrial camera? For example, we can get a camera which has a high resolution with nanoparticle technology. <laughs> That's another very good point. Thank you for the question. That's they suggestion in principle, I think, yes, you, you could develop uh, an anthropomorphic uh, camera because, as you know, the light, uh, say the eye, has a log polar geometry in the retina. And the way we sample the environment is in log polar scale, it's not in Cartesian coordinates, which means that if I show you how the image comes to the brain, you would uh, hardly distinguish what it is, even though it's a very simple picture. Um, so that, that's an interesting thing. And the reason why our eye is like this is that it is saving a lot of memory space in the brain. So if having a camera as we are in the, we have in the phone uh, to in the eye with the same performance would require 
an optic nerve, which is uh, uh, 10 times larger in diameter, and uh, a brain, which is uh, order of magnitude heavier to process all the data. So nature, the evolution came out with a solution, which is very interesting. So it, to reproduce this uh, with, the, with, with nanoparticle in, a, in an artificial camera would be very interesting. Of course, you can do the same thing with, with some uh, with silicon and uh, reprogramming. Uh, I mean, it's so powerful microelectronics that you can do almost everything. But uh, it, it could be interesting. Uh, the other thing is color vision, because as I said at the beginning, colorimetry is, uh, um, is particularly um, receive a lot of benefit from using organics. And the reason is that silicon, as you know, has a single gap and it doesn't see really color. It starts from the infrared. So what they do is they put the color filter in front, but that is far from uh, the natural vision. So the way we reconstruct color sensation is very artificial. Uh, with, with organics, you could build a colorimeter, which is able to see light, uh, colors in a much more natural way. So in general, I, I think your suggestion is very interesting. Uh, we are not doing this, but uh, but it's something I, having resources and time, I, I would try to do it. Thanks. For robotics, for instance. Question? Sure, sure, Brian. Uh, so... Ah, yeah, no, I read the How Do Infants Brain Learn thesis, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's an imperfect image. <laughs> that's, I, I don't know, actually. That's a question for uh, evolutionary biologists, probably. It's, um, I think at the end, that's the only way we receive images from the world. So it, um, it probably builds up. So the thing is, the brain never know that the image is uh, inverted. It just learn that uh, if you want to go through a door, you should uh, see that signal and, and go through that hole that you see. So I, I, I believe this is not something that the brain is really learning. It's just how the brain is, uh, uh, is, uh, is working from, from the very beginning. Because sometimes we think it's like what I was saying before with the log polar. So we think uh, uh, the brain no distinguish uh, our way to see things and, and his own way, but it's not as easy. I mean, there is only one way and that's it. So the brain received the world upside down. But uh, once the, the kid, the, the little kid is following, uh, he, he, he learns. That's what I think, but they don't don't take my words uh, as a scientific <laughs> any value because you need to ask the biologist. I think, but it's a good, it's a curious, interesting question. Curious, really. Uh, there was one more question: uh, Can this technology also help uh, AMD? So I think he's referring to age-related. Yeah, no, that's a good point. That's a very good point. So in principle, yes. Uh, now, what is the challenge? AMD is only attacking cone. Cone are in the fovea which is a uh, few millimeter square spot. And the desk is very high there. And so the resolution should be as well very high. So you have to go exactly in that point and uh, you need to have enough uh, resolution. So in principle, yes. But uh, as we are right now, uh, I think is, uh, it would be stretching a bit uh, the thing to say that we go for macro generation. It's something that uh, it will come. With some improvement, uh, like the specific biological targeting of the of the poly of the nanoparticle uh, to, to specific uh, size, uh, so it, it's still uh, I would say it's still a challenge. It's a possi it's possible. Uh, it for sure is one of our target for the, for the next uh, work. Mm, but right now, I, I wouldn't say it's, uh, it's it's what we have. I mean that we can do it. But hopefully, I mean, it's, it's much more interesting actually in macro degeneration because there are much more people affected by this. All right, uh, Vivek has another question. Vivek, go ahead. Hi, Professor. Um, so I, I was just going on the idea that you that, about using nanoparticles for cameras, and I was realizing that there's something called as the dynamic vision sensor or the neuromorphic cameras, which kind of replicates how the mm -hmm. retina operates as well by creating a stream of events similar mm -hmm. to the, how the retina behaves. So I was wondering if uh, these kind of nanoparticle-based devices that you're currently using could be actually used to make these new generation of cameras, dynamic vision sensors, mm -hmm. rather. Uh, that could be very interesting. Yeah, it would be very interesting. Uh, I think it would be interesting to make uh, a bio-hybrid system 
because uh, now thinking again, say our nanoparticles here are working in the eye because they couple to bipolar cell. If there is no bipolar cell, then uh, you you are left with the usual organic photodiode in a way. So we should consider this. I mean, it would be interesting to develop uh, artificially a system in which there are living cells, neurons, and nanoparticles together, and we build an organ uh, or an organoid, an eye, in this way. So that that, that could be that would be an interesting uh, an interesting approach. Otherwise, in general, I mean, we should be aware that silicon can easily uh, make uh, small, uh, say, few microns is, is surely not a problem. So uh, we, we should not go in competition with silicon because silicon microelectronics win. <laughs> uh, that's why one reason we are in the eye. Uh, the silicon is not so good when you go to the eye. It's alien to any biological tissue. The, the, the retina is extremely soft, uh, and, and so it's, what they do with the silicon is that they stick uh, something that is like um, it's, it's a heavy stone in, in the sand, you know? so they are devastating everything and putting this in the tissue and, and shooting their currents. It's a very rough approach. Thank you. Um. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Lazini, for your answering all the amazing questions and for your amazing sharing sessions. And I would like to thank everyone again for your wonderful participants, participation in this event. So before you leave the webinar, uh, we will actually post some QR code for the survey and our attendance form. So we will actually value your feedback, which help us to improve our seminar in the future. So before you leave, do scan this QR code and help us by doing the survey. Thank you so much. Ah, okay, okay, yes, I will. Thank you again, to all of you and to the organizer for uh, for the invitation. It was a, was a pleasure for me to talk about my research, and I hope soon to to be able to come back to Singapore, which is always a, a very nice place to be. Yeah, thank you so much, Prof. Yeah, we're looking forward to uh, welcoming you to NTU in the future. Thank you.